what's good, Internet? It's Kamal from Penn High School Music Journalism. Uh, today, uh, we're honored to be interviewing Kenny Siegel. Kenny, what's up? Hey, how's it going? And then so um, for the people who may not be too familiar with your work, could you please briefly introduce yourself and what you do? Uh, I'm a music producer. I'm mainly known for my work with some kind of offbeat indie hip hop artists such as like Milo, Open Mike Eagle. Though I also have worked with a lot of like guys from back in the day like Freestyle Fellowship, Abstract Rude, and I also do music for TV and movies and video games and basically anyone that'll like pay me to make music pretty much. We talked about this earlier, but like how would you describe your style or do you have a concrete style? Yeah, what I had said was that although a lot of people probably perceive my music as like jazzy rap beats, uh, I look at it as it's there's an like I have like different every album I do, I try to like tailor a sound to that artist or yeah. even just to that album if it's like a solo album. Yeah. And to me, that's more what my sound is. My sound is something that's well crafted around whatever project it is. Yeah. And I think the thing that links it all aesthetically is that I often have kind of like sparse productions. I'm yeah. not like the type of producer that makes very like tricky, full of little ear candy yeah. kind of things. Like, not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just not really my style. Yeah. Uh, and that I'm really into like the texture and like the timbre of yeah. sound. So whether it's like a really aggressive track or like a laid back track or like a sad track or a jazzy track, like, I always pay a lot of attention to the like the texture of the different sounds that are on it and try to be really selective of what noises I put into a song. Like I'm not just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall kind of I'm trying to put things that really that everything has a purpose hopefully in the beat. Yeah, that makes sense. So like what I've noticed like with your past collaboration albums, so with like Hemlock Ernst, uh you two worked really well together with I guess like you working with Hemlock, he gave off like the jazzy classic vibe. And then you paired that up really well with your production with the jazzy uh, soulful beats with hiding places. Um, Billy's a more like all over the place kind of guy, I guess, with how he raps and his subject matter. So you reflected that with the production with. Right. To me, yeah. when, when I hear like most of the artists I work with, one of the things that makes me want to work with someone is not just that they're super dope in the first like first of all they need to be dope and original yeah but then i like working with people where when i hear what they're already doing i'm like oh that's tight but i have an idea of how i could do it that'll be like even better or, or like yeah. a different way of presenting it so when i hear heard woods's music and the arm and hammer stuff it was like so intense all the beats they're always like really intense but the problem is sometimes they're like intense and busy and it's hard to like hear all their vocals and it's yeah. hard. So like with him, when I, when I was like, what I'm hoping to do is match the intensity of the people he already works with, yeah. but like make it like a little bit more spacious so that he has like room so that you can hear everything he's doing, like putting him on a pedestal, but hopefully still keeping the intensity up, like without the wall of noise at the same time, or like making the wall of noise like a specific way like i don't know if you ever so when i was younger i was really into nine inch nails when i was yeah. growing up the, the, the industrial band. group yeah. and one thing that i loved about trent reznor's production and like that was when i first really started realizing that being a producer was like like being a musician itself like and how because he had so much production in his albums even though it was like industrial not hip-hop but uh he would be able to make a song where it was like literally this like wall of distortion, like coming out of the speakers. And then he'd whisper something and you could hear his whisper so well, like every nuance of his words. It sounded yeah. like it was in your head almost. And to me, that's like an amazing thing, how you can have something that's like really intense, but also have enough space that you can like somehow the vocals like shine through. Yeah. So a lot of times, like Woods, that was one of the things that like when I heard him, I was like, or when I started working on that project that I was like trying to really do. And to be honest, Rory, even though, though Rory has a totally different type of vibe than Woods, Rory being Milo, uh, yeah. when we started with So The Flies Don't Come, when I first met Rory and started working with him, my main point of reference for his music at that time was Toothpaste Suburb, which I also had a similar feeling about. I was like, 
these glitchy electronic beats are dope, but they're so busy. Sometimes the producer, the beat is as much a part of this. The beat is like trying to like compete with the vocalist sometimes. Yeah. And like when we were doing So the Flies Don't Come again, I was like trying to like just let this amazing dude have a chance to like shine through and like like not make the beats boring, but like make them something where he can stand on top of it and do his thing as opposed to like fighting each other. I don't know. And I think that that's kind of a theme with a lot of the artists that I work with uh, trying to like do something that's more it's putting them more on a pedestal than maybe the typical project. That makes perfect sense. Um, you talked about Nine Inch Nails. Are there any, like, is there any contemporary music or producers that you draw inspiration from? Oh, I mean, definitely. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm going to name the usual hip-hop subjects, like, suspects, like Mad Lib and yeah. stuff like that. But, yeah, like, like Flood and Trent Reznor. F- Flood was the guy who mixed and co-produced a lot of the early Nine Inch Nails albums, like, the, the, that was a huge influence on me back in the day. Uh, but and even to this day, on like my production style. Uh, dang, I should have written these things down. I'm really bad at like being on the spot about stuff. Oh, that's all good. <laughs> uh, I mean, also, to be honest, my producer homies that I work with, like Mr. Carmack, uh, Mike Parvizi, uh, all, all of the, the dudes that I'm like close with, like one of the reasons why we all work together is because we inspire each other. I, I like see how they do things that are different than me and they see how I do things that are different than them. And we all kind of like, like go off each other. Another person who doesn't get a lot of shine as a producer necessarily, but I know like every time I hang out with them, I get really inspired is a uh, Safari Al from the Ruby Yacht Collective. Yeah. So he does a lot of his production. He did he did a lot of the production on that 37 Gems mixtape that they put out last year. That was the Ruby Yacht mixtape. And he does a lot of his stuff with just like this basic loop pedal. It like literally it's it's not even like the super fancy one that you see people use that that's all digital. It's like the Roland one that's like a red pedal and just has two pedals oh. on it. Uh and he makes all the beats just with that. He just hooks up his MPC 1000 with some samples. He jams out totally unquantized a little drum thing and loops that and then just starts layering shit on top of it and you can't fuck up. It's just like you're just layering stuff and like there's no undo. There's no, you, if you fuck up, you just start over from the beginning basically. And then the beat arrangement is just him turning off the different layers and stuff. And it's so simple. And even though like I strive to make stuff sometimes more complex than what he's doing like when i see him do that it makes me go home and i'm like oh shit, i want to do like i don't know there's certain things like you see people do techniques and it really gets you inspired to do stuff even if you're not doing the exact same thing that they're doing it just like gets me all like jazzed up to like work on stuff all right yeah like how do you approach making songs um we've talked about this a bit before but it'd be nice to touch a bit on it again so are we talking about like making songs with an MC about you had asked last time, like, does the beat come first or does the lyrics come first? Yeah. So although nothing is set in stone, because sometimes people do send me lyrics to a click track or all sorts of things. Typically how things work is I like to, when I start a beat, I don't always flesh it all out. Sometimes a beat might literally be like three sounds looped on top of each other that I think sound good together. Like, it's just like a basic idea. And often that's what I'm playing for these MCs, especially when it's someone that I've already worked with before where we have a rapport. If it's someone like new, a lot of times I'm maybe sending a slightly more fleshed out idea, but like I'm working with Rory, for instance, a lot of times I send him like really, really basic ideas. And then he'll write to that, send me what he wrote. And then I'll start fleshing out the beat, adding more elements, changing the arrangement up. Cause to me that like that back and forth, and then he might even re-record the songs like, like the new rap Pereira album that happened on a lot of songs where he had done a demo on a really basic beat. Then me and Mike and, and Carmack like did a whole bunch more production, sometimes transforming it into something like way bigger or different than what it originally was. And then he was out here in LA uh, one week and basically in like a two day period, redid the vocals for about two like a third of the maybe somewhere between a third and a half of the songs on the album uh he just read i mean a few of them we ended up keeping the original demos just because we liked them better but like after he heard all the changes we did to the beat he just did the vocals again reacting to it so it's that back and forth and to me that's really important like a lot of times 
with younger people or like that work all over the internet, like in modern times, like there's not as much of that, like interaction. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's how, that's how I like to work. Another thing is like back in the day, this doesn't happen as much because now a lot of the people I work with don't live in LA, but like back in the day when I first started, most rap songs I worked with, certainly with the project bloat guys, they would like come over and I would just play the beat and they would literally write to it right then. And then we would oh, do yeah. a song. Uh, not, I don't record with as a lot of, I, I like to, as a producer, my job is to like get the best performance out of people. So I work with however they want to work. Most of the rappers I work with these days don't work like that. They like to write on their own, uh, and sometimes even demo things on their own. Uh, but ultimately to me, I, I like to find out when I work with someone new, like how they feel most comfortable working. And then I kind of get behind that and try and, cause to me, that's like a big part of being a producer is like bringing out the best of, of the person you're producing. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so next up, uh, you originally moved to California to pursue uh, computer engineering. You ended up switching your major to audio engineering and using that to pursue music. So um, what influenced you to pursue music and what's your personal background uh, with music? So, although I think I told you last time, like yeah. no one in my family was really musical, but I, I took some piano lessons when I was like probably in yeah. like elementary school. And then I played cello all through middle school and high school in the orchestra. So music was already, I, and according to my parents, I was drumming on the table and making beats <laughs> in my head from yeah. a very early age. Uh, also, once I was in high school, I met someone who kind of introduced me to like this is back in the mid 90s when computers were kind of a newer thing and like the internet was a fairly new thing so there was like a scene on the early internet back when it was the bulletin boards before the world wide web where they had a sampler kind of sequencers it was almost like it had it, it was it was a four track sampler like for your computer and it was like an ms dos program so we're talking about so old before windows even uh, it was called Fast Tracker, and there was there was a couple of them. There's Mod Tracker, Fast Tracker. Anyway, I downloaded one of them on my parents' computer, probably around tenth grade, and started fooling around at that point with audio experiments. I also had a friend that I met who, who like he had a drum machine and some turntables, and then I eventually bought a four track, maybe by like eleventh grade. So we were already like experimenting between the computer music stuff, and then like with my friend with the four track and the drum machine. I was already like kind of making music when I was in high school. Uh, so by the time I moved to California for college, I was really into drum and bass at the time. So I was making drum and bass beats and I happened to meet some people uh, at USC that were already like a pretty well-known drum and bass DJ crew, but they didn't know how to make beats. So I started becoming the producer of their crew and was teaching them all how to make beats. And pretty quickly started getting to play at all these big raves because they were already like well established like playing at all the like the big the big like warehouse raves and like out in the forest type raves so anyway uh my freshman year i was still a computer i came out there for computers but pretty quickly my original intent with computers was i was going to try and learn how to make like music software with computers that was what i wanted to study but then once i started like making a little bit of money and realizing like there was like a path for me to just do music. I was like, well, shit, I want to do music. So yeah. I switched to the audio engineering uh, program, much to my parents' dismay at the time. Uh, but they were very, they were pretty supportive. I, I was very lucky that I had supportive parents because I went to school with a scholarship for computers and then switched to yeah the music school. But anyway, uh, yeah, that was kind of what, it was really like meeting those guys and doing the drum and bass that kind of made me start realizing like, oh, this thing I was already fooling around with in high school, maybe it could be more than just fooling around. As a DJ, you met rappers, and then that's how you have grown to become a hip hop producer. Um, could you tell us about like the the shift, what it was like, how you felt? and? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that was around shortly after college or towards the end of college was when uh, a little LA history. So a lot of people have heard of low end theory before, which yeah. is daddy Kev's club. Uh, so low end theory was around for 12 years before low end theory. Daddy Kev had a drum and bass club called concrete jungle. Yeah. 
And that was back when I was in college and we used to DJ there a lot. And Concrete Jungle had a drum and bass room and it had a hip hop room. And the hip hop room, all the Project Load MCs used to come and hang out and freestyle. So I didn't even know who those guys were at the time. I was just some kid from Maryland. I started meeting them uh, and sometimes they would come and hang out uh, at SC, like with me and my, my homies, cause daddy Kev would bring them over to my, to my dorm. Uh, and they heard me making beats. And at the time I was mainly making drum and bass beats, but I was also making hip hop. I, I, I wasn't really thinking of them as hip hop beats. I was just making things that weren't drum and bass. So yeah. some of them started rapping on that and peace from freestyle fellowship took a liking to my beats. And I didn't realize it at the time cause I was so young and didn't really understand the whole legacy of freestyle fellowship, but peace was quite famous already as like an MC. And when he started rapping on my beats, all the other Project Blood guys were like, oh, who's this white kid that Peace is going over to his house and making dope songs with? So they all started coming over to my house uh, or to my my dorm, basically. And uh, we I started recording. And, and part of it was also, at the time, it was just so fun to me, like recording. So I recorded everyone for free. Uh, so that was another way where I, how I got my foot in the door with a lot of those people is like, I would just make beats all day and then record people all night when they'd come over. Like, uh, yeah. and, uh, yeah, I did a whole lot of stuff for free back then just to try and, I mean, to me it was just fun and that's how I got good at it. And I, I think that that's a lesson that's a totally different lesson, but that a lot of people could learn is that sometimes people these days get like super concerned about like how to monetize their art, like very quickly. Yeah. Like, although, yes, I make a living off my music now. I've been doing this for like 20 years. Like for the first five to 10 years of me doing this, I was not making a living off my music. I was doing it as first as a hobby. But then just like even when I was trying to make it a career, I still worked for free or for very little money most of the time because I was building my skills up. Like, yeah. like I guess what I'm saying is like a lot of people, I think, put the cart before the horse. Like, like there is a moment where you need to be like, yo, I got to get paid or I got to get paid more for what I'm doing. Cause I'm good at it. Yeah. But first you got to get good at it. And a lot of people I think like yeah. start off before they've even gotten good at it yeah. thinking like, Oh, how can I make sure I get paid or don't get taken advantage of? And it's like, you know what? Don't worry about that. Get really good. And then when people want to take advantage of you, cause you're so good, then you should worry about that. Like as you transition to, to hip hop, how did your skills from producing uh, drum and bass beats how did that carry over and is there anything new you needed to learn or adapt to not really I think I touched on this yesterday yeah. about how to me if anything it was kind of liberating because one reason why I think with drum and bass my beats were never that successful was that I'm not really good or I don't like to yeah. conform to the rules and a lot of electronic genres at least back then you if you didn't like make it DJ friendly if you didn't have the right like 64 yeah. bar intro with going into the build up, into the drop, into the breakdown, into the main piece, like if you didn't have it all mapped out just the way that it was supposed to be, people basically just wouldn't play your song or yeah. just didn't like it. And I never really liked doing that. I always made these strange drum and bass songs that were yeah. drum and bass, but they didn't follow the format. So hip hop to me has a lot less of, well, back then there was more rules, but still less rules than drum and bass yeah and then once the low end theory explosion happened with like flying lotus and everyone coming out and showing that you could actually combine because when i first started focusing more on hip-hop i kind of kept the hip-hop and the electronic music somewhat separate in yeah. that it wasn't very cool normally to have electronic sounds and hip-hop beats like uh but yeah then once flying lotus happened it like changed the whole game and all yeah. of a sudden like all the genre barriers were broken. And to me, that was awesome because it allowed me to just kind of do all the different things I like to do and not really worry that much about it uh, and just be more free in general. Yeah, and you talk about how you feel freed at learning new genres. Um, do you think that if you were to expand your production to other uh, genres, like maybe, maybe more like... Uh, like outside of rap, I guess what I'm trying to say, if you expanded your production outside of rap? Y'all only hear a small portion of yeah. the music that I actually make. So I dabble in all sorts of things. Also with some of the music that I do for TV stuff, it's in yeah. all sorts of genres, house yeah. beats, rock songs, orchestral stuff sometimes yeah. even. Uh, so I have many different outlets where I 
do all sorts of music. And yes, I definitely like to do all, I get bored otherwise. That's one of the things I like about doing the TV and movie music is like that those jobs let me do things that I would never normally do or like try things out. Uh, And as far as electronic music, I mean, I think like on Happy Little Trees, the album I did in 2018 that was instrumentals that had like some like footwork kind of songs. Like I definitely dabble in different things. Uh, like I don't think you're gonna see like a drum yeah. and bass album from me. Like that's gonna yeah. be straight up drum and bass anytime soon. But I definitely dabble in all of those things, and I love working with rappers and vocalists that are down to like experiment with weird rhythms and stuff. Like one thing I love about Rory is like he's always down for like one or two songs on every album we do together yeah. to be on some like. Like they're never like a real dance genre. Like like the song like song about a ray gun on on so the flies don't come. It's kind of footwork ish, but it's yeah. not really footwork. Uh, uh, what other songs have we done? It like the song uh, sorcerer, one of my favorite songs I've ever done with Rory. That one's like kind of has a trap beat almost. I want to say, but it's like <laughs> not a trap beat at all. Yeah. Like uh, so, I love doing that. I love like dabbling in the like the pal the sound palette of like or like the tropes of like different genres but then like still bringing it back into what i'm trying to do and like my my stuff so i think i already do that a lot yeah. uh and yeah as far as just like straight up other genres like like i said i do make songs for all sorts of things it's just that not everyone hears them or is aware of them necessarily yeah and so could we see potentially, well, we're definitely going to see a lot more electronic albums from you in the future, right? For sure. Yeah. Um, all right. And so like, what about like producing for some singers or some like something Yeah, like that? you know what? Uh, that is one of my goals for the next year is to do an album where I produce for, for a vocalist that's yeah. not a rapper. Yeah. Uh, I don't know exactly who that's going to be. I mean, I already, like, I have, like, plenty. Not only do I have, like, the albums that are, like, definitely coming out that I'm, like, working on right now, but I always have, like, two or three things that are, like, irons in the fire that of, like, people I'm building with. So I am building with a few people that are singers. uh, But uh, I don't know definitely who it's going to be yet or what's actually going to materialize. But, yes, like, that is definitely something I'm interested in doing more of. All right, cool, cool. Your frequent collaborators, um, Billy, Hemlock Ernst, uh, Milo, Rubiach, etc. Um, you've made a lot of collaboration projects in the past. Um, what are some collaboration projects we can expect in the future? Well, the most immediate thing is that me and my crew, the Jefferson Park Boys, yeah. which is me, Mr. Carmack, and Mike Parvizi, yeah. we produced the upcoming Rat Ferreira album that's going to come out on March 6th. Yeah. So that's like 18 song hour long album. That's all our production with, with Rory. Yeah. That's really dope. And in my opinion, might be the best thing I've ever done. Oh, really? Uh, I mean, I, I strive for every album to feel that way when it comes out. This one, yeah. I can definitely tell you feels that way. Uh, oh, it's, I'm, I'm it's, hyped. It's really dope. Yeah. Uh, I also have an album that's over halfway done with this rapper named Paul Barman, who he's kind of like a, like a, when, well, in the early 2000s, he was pretty well known. He was like this goofy white rapper that had like really kind of funny, but sometimes political lyrics. Uh, and he worked, he became well known because he worked with, I don't know if you know who Prince Paul is. No. Prince Paul did a lot of the production for De La Soul back in the day. So Prince Paul took Paul Paul Barman under his wings and he, he did like the first album for him. And then MF Doom did most of the beats for Paul's second album. So he's always worked with like really, really dope producers. Like he put out an album a few years ago that Quest Love did a lot of the beats for, in fact. Uh, but anyway, so I'm doing his new album and it's really fun. It's like we got some crazy songs is all I can say. So <laughs> that one will probably come out by the end of 2020, I'm guessing. Yeah. And then the Jefferson Park Boys, me and Mike and, uh, and Carmack, we have another project. We put out a project back in 2017 or 18 that was an instrumental project. So we're going to put out another project sometime this year, probably in the summertime, hopefully. That's another collab project. And uh, yeah, all the other things I have in the works, I can't really talk about yet because they're not like sure enough. I don't want to like jinx them. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always working. And let me say this, like 
yeah, like like there'll be at least two more rap out two rap albums this year. But I, I strive to have at least like two every year, hopefully. Uh, to end this interview off, um, is there anything you'd like to say to the kids at Penn Music Journalism? Hey, I feel like I did a bad job last time. When we did this. <laughs> All right, this time I'm just gonna say that. Uh, yeah, y'all. I think what I what I said last time was that y'all are super lucky because when I was when I was your age like making music or doing any artistic stuff with computers or it was like not easily accessible. Like at my, at my high school, like I was the only person I knew that was doing music with computers with that software. And there was really only like two other people that I hung out with that had like drum machines and turntables or anything like, like knowing how to DJ, that was not something people knew how to do back then. Yeah. Uh, you need to, and the fact that you can make beats, that you can edit videos, you you can do so much crazy stuff just like on your phone or certainly on your laptop is amazing to me. And, and like, I wish they had tools like that back when I was young. Like it, I can only imagine what a head start I would have had if I was doing that. Like the, the pains I needed to go through when I was 15 <laughs> to make like create, to make a beat using like a four track in my computer, my parents, like, IBM like Pentium computer or whatever was just so arcane and crazy and like yeah if I could have just been doing it on my phone all day I don't think I I probably wouldn't have done good in school because I would have like been making beats all day in high school <laughs> instead of paying attention to class yeah and and before we talked about how um like with all of the tools that are so accessible now like everybody's pretty much trying to become the next like the next wave like you know you got like kids in high school being SoundCloud rappers in their spare time. I think what I was trying to say was just that some people I know that are older get like annoyed that there's so much, so many people making music now and so many people making just art in general, whether you're a photographer or a painter or anything and social media, everyone has like access to putting it up on the internet and anyone can become viral. But to me, the, it doesn't really bug me because I still think I see the cream rising to the top. And if, if anything, like all of the spliced sample packs and all that stuff, it just makes everyone else's stuff sound so much more plain that if you're doing something special, it like stands out even more. If yeah, anything. for sure. Yeah. And like, uh, I, so yeah. that, that doesn't really concern me. Well, I know like that's something I hear like people of my generation probably saying like in response <laughs> to what I had just said about how easy it is to like, learn how to make beats and all that stuff now uh and and one more one more piece of more advice because i feel like that wasn't really advice is what is building on what i said earlier is that like ultimately making music or painting or or photography or any of these types of things or videos you're making art making art should be for yourself if your main motivation is for other people to like, like it or to become famous or to become known or to make money when you're just starting out, then you're probably, I can just tell you, you're not going to succeed. Like the people that succeed are normally people that are genuine, that are, that, that are doing it because they want to do it regardless of what happens. And that's normally the type of thing, like people, people feel that people can see that when, and so like the best Court, yeah, don't like. I feel like a lot of young people. I see them being too concerned about everything except for the art itself. Yeah. Like when they're making art, and I would say like, create, make stuff for yourself. Be happy about it just for the sake of doing it, and and all the other stuff will follow naturally if it was meant to be. And if it wasn't, it might not be meant to be. Uh, but yeah, like trying to like manufacture that sh- from the get go, I think is a bad idea most of the time um i know i, I said earlier this was going to be like 15 minutes and now it's 40 <laughs> oh dang so, has it been that long All yeah right. thank you so much for your time yeah no problem uh, it was fun chatting with you a second time hopefully uh, we got everything uh down this time